Hey y'all, how you doing? I am Sam Sparkman. This is my Twitch channel, and I think I'm gonna paint a little bit. Uh, hello to a person in chat. I really appreciate you. Uh, the vibe is gonna be really chill here. I haven't live streamed in a long time. This is kind of a new thing to me. I last did this like two years ago and I'm kind of trying to get back into the swing of things because I've kind of thought about it and I'm like, I would like to make internet content. I think I have <clears throat> neat ideas, a winning personality, and a uh, big draw to the limelight, but I want to get out somehow because I'm a selfish theater kid. Um, and today, I'm hoping to just be very chill and do a little bit of painting. Um, I have let my mini painting uh, kind of fall behind in the grand scheme of my hobbies and interests, if I'm being honest. I've not done very much of it lately, and so this is going to be a little bit of me kind of um, relearning how to paint miniatures, because uh, it's not something that I've done much in the last little while. So right now we are looking at a mini that I'm going to need for the D&D &D thing that I'm running in a minute here. Say hello to Sutgur the Vile, uh, an orcish shaman who has been wreaking havoc at the Temple of Ashir just outside the town of Redfen. Um, I would like to paint her up. Uh, she is a miniature from the Epic Encounters line by Steamforged Games. I really like their sculpts and designs. They get a little bit muddy sometimes, but the actual like design themselves, if not the printing, I think is really, really excellent. And they come in these big boxes with a little, like really big variety of miniatures that I really appreciate. So this is what we're going to be painting right now. Uh, just because I'm a big self-conscious bean. Uh, I'm also gonna show off real quick some of the other stuff I've painted in the last little while, uh, just because I'm trying to make some decisions about, whoa, that's a lot of water all at once. Um, I'm trying to make some decisions about how I want to paint Sutger. Uh, and one of those big questions is whether or not we're gonna use metallic paints or whether we're gonna try to paint non-metallic metals. I'm not very good at non-metallic metals yet, but there's only one way to get better at painting stuff, and uh, unfortunately, that is to paint stuff. So, uh, I'm thinking about running non-metallic metals uh, for this wonderful shaman, uh, because I would like to get better at this, and I think that uh, that's neat. Let me plug my phone in real quick, so that hopefully it doesn't uh, die while we're doing this. Now. Here's some of the other stuff that I've painted previously. Is this gonna, is this vaguely focused? Y'all are gonna have to let me know how my audio and how my video are. I ran a little test stream for like 15 minutes earlier and my wonderful partner Mars uh, came and gave me a hand making sure everything was kind of set up. But things might still go wrong because I have had to slightly change things since then because I came in here and ate lunch. Uh, this is one of the other Steamforged dorks. I just wanted to show you all this because as much as it's not like really focusing well. I really like the skin tones that I did for this one. I really like the highlights. I think that it looks quite good. I haven't done anything but those skin tones yet, so you can't really uh, distinguish them well, but I think that that looks pretty good. I'm probably going to switch over to this guy pretty soon, even though my players have already killed the particular enemy that I used this miniature for. Uh, and then I might switch over to right here to um, this guy, uh, Cook. Cook is uh, the, the chef of this little orcish uh, raiding party, and I really love this miniature. It's big, it's dorky, it's silly, but I also think it'll be a really unique fight for the players, so I'm excited for that. When I talk about non-metallic metals for these miniatures, uh, what I'm talking about is stuff like on this Valkyrie that I painted right here, where, um, let me hold it at a little bit of a distance so the brush strokes are a little less obvious, uh, although here is where it's focused for. So, um, I didn't use any metallic paint for this mini. I have painted on highlights and shine for where there are metal. Like, if you look at the, uh, middle of this shield right here, um, there's kind of that like white glow, there's a fade from black to kind of gold to white. That's what I mean by non-metallic metals. I mean painting the miniature to look like there are shiny, there is shiny metal on it, when in fact, it 
it's all flat colors and that is as opposed to using a paint that has pigments uh like actual like metallic pigments in it that make it reflective that make it shine um i wasn't going for a completely like metallic look on things like the backpacks and the uh boots and stuff of these infinity soldiers but it's the same kind of technique where there's a lot of blending with a lot of like bright highlights to show a little bit of a sheen um so it's a skill set that i've been kind of practicing lately with my miniatures but it is not something that i'm especially good at yet like if you look at that sword uh you can kind of tell what i'm going for but it also doesn't exactly look like it's glowing in the sunlight either uh but like i said there's only one way to get better at non-metallic metals and like this right here is a big surface to put metals onto uh that i think would be a really good opportunity to practice sorry i'm adjusting i have right in front of me i have a little magnifying glass that i use to look at the minis while i'm painting them so i'm going to be looking through this magnifying glass at the miniature and you guys are going to be looking through my phone at the miniature so we're going to be getting a little bit of a different view now if i totally had my way i would be painting with this light turned on to the miniature, uh, so that I can actually see what I'm doing very, very clearly. Here's the problem. It makes the video l look like this. Uh, so, that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna leave this off for as long as I can reasonably paint like this. Uh, and then if it gets too dark, I'll turn it on, and y'all are just gonna have to suffer and look at the horribly blown out image because I like to be able to see what it is that I'm painting. But in the meantime, I'm gonna be uh, using a magnifying glass, which is a little bit new for what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm gonna be using that magnifying glass without uh, light. I have the flash on my camera, which is why it looks okay right now because y'all are getting light from the same direction as the camera. Um, yeah, uh, so this guy right here, Korag, we are probably gonna touch eventually. Uh, Sutger the Vile, who is right, I have completely lost the miniature that I'm actually supposed to paint. She's still on the paint handle. Uh, this is Sutger. This is the mini that I am like most actively invested in painting because I think right now the colors that I started her with are really, really ugly. Uh, and I would like to have her painted for the next session of the D&D game that I'm running right now. So this is the priority. Uh, second priorities being Korag and Cook and these other miniatures over here just being to show, hey, I do know how to paint. I'm just uh, relearning at the moment. Uh, so thank you for being here and I'm gonna jump into actually painting in just a second. Um, feel free to hop in the chat if you have questions about literally anything. I'm gonna be doing a lot of just like casually painting and vibing and so if anybody wants to jump in and have a little chat we can talk about D&D, we can talk about life, we can talk about anything y'all damn well please. I also am gonna bring my palette into the equation over here because it turns out paint is important to painting and I'm gonna do this. And just a heads up to anybody hanging out that wants to be uh, around for the long haul uh, what we're probably gonna do here is I'm gonna paint for what I'm expecting to be probably about an hour here uh, and then I'm going to switch over to writing some stuff I've got some Dungeons and Dragons content that I've been meaning to finish up actually like writing for the next game that I'm running and then I've got a couple of like kind of rule system stuff that I really want to get finished and I would love y'all's company to kind of keep me honest and keep me motivated there's also going to be a lot of me shaking paint bottles and doing this because my paints have not been given love in a long while. So there's a lot of me talking through the jiggles. <laughs> oh, so how are we all doing today? There we go. Let's start with some, uh, oh, we missed the most important part of the stream. Uh, we call this part, which of Sam's brushes are completely ruined because uh, I don't remember which of my brushes can like actually hold a point once I wet them and which ones are totally messed up. So this guy right here, we're gonna use uh, Big Boy. Big Boy is gonna be uh, mostly used. We'll use it for some bigger surfaces later, but mostly I'm gonna use it to actually take paint from my pot. 
uh, put it onto my wet palette. That's going to be the like main first use for this guy right here. That's probably not enough paint, but you know what? We work with what we've got. Uh, let's see. Um, try not to lick paintbrushes once they have paint on them. Before they have paint on them, it's probably reasonably safe, and boy does it help them hold a point better. Uh, if any of these paintbrushes can even kind of do that to begin with. Which of these is better? This one, or it looks like it's going to be this one right here. Although I remember this one having a weird little burr on the end. I could use some new equipment, but that is not the point right now. All right. Let's do this thing. So wet palette is going to thin down the acrylics here. Our ideal uh, base coat right here is something that I do will have to reapply new layers of later. But, uh, sorry, so like thin enough that it goes on uh, such that I will need to put multiple coats. But thick enough that it's not pooling and running, which is what it's doing right now. I want it thick enough that it, just thick enough that it stays where I put it, but not any thicker. That's the goal, which I think we're getting closer to now. And y'all let me know if I'm like sneaking out of the frame or anything. Yeah, so what I'm doing now is I'm applying a uh, pretty like dark beige brown to um, uh, the like horn and bone exposed pieces on this miniature and I'm not taking too much care to sort out details and stuff because this is very much just the base coat uh, for these kind of big blocked out regions and later on I'm going to do both highlights on those bone pieces and then also uh, pull out the details in different colors but just for the base coat I'm just I'm blocking out major colors and I'm not being too careful about what it is that I'm hitting um, and so what I'm doing right now also I talked about uh, thinning out the paint enough that it's not uh, that I'm gonna need to put multiple coats uh, first reason for that is uh, just that I'm putting on multiple coats I'm putting them on thin so they don't look chalky uh, so that the colors aren't obnoxious the paint doesn't block out detail by being too thick that kind of thing uh, the other big reason for this as you'll notice that where my mini is primed, it is primed with both black and white in a way that pulls out the highlights. Like this miniature, you can already make out quite a few details on it uh, in a way that with just a miniature of all one color, you cannot. That is because I primed this with what is called Zenithal Highlighting. And uh, when you prime a miniature with Zenithal Highlighting, you're using an airbrush or rattle cans, and I use an airbrush. Um, and you are painting the whole miniature black, and then you are spraying it with white primer or pretty commonly, and in my case, white ink. So something uh, thin that does, again, the, that same thing of like uh, many thin coats and just like a little bit of highlighting. Um, and you're spraying that with a, an airbrush or with a rattle can just from the top. So you're basically, you are simulating the sun. You are making your rattle can the sun and you are just hitting the big pieces at the top of the miniature and that right there is uh how you create this kind of like pre-highlighted look where this is a miniature that is basically unpainted but you can see all these details and you can see the shading blocked out i'm going to paint over most of that paint but it is going to both help me define where highlights should be when i paint them and if I'm using thin coats of thin paint, uh, it's also going to, that's going to allow some of that original color to peek through unless or until I put on lots and lots of coats of paint. And because I'm not really planning on doing that, um, the Zenithal highlighting is going to come through a little bit in the uh, uh, later process, just as kind of characterizing the other colors that I've put through. One thing that I say is I framed this uh, uh, stream as Sam relearns how to paint. That is very much the case. The things that I'm saying, I'm describing to you the reason that I understand that I'm doing these things, but I am not an excellent or particularly well-trained visual artist. I don't know anything about color theory. I don't like really know anything about paints 
what I know is what I've been taught and what I've been told and what has seemed to work for me on the specific previous projects that I have done these things for. So, this is your preface that uh, anything that I say, take it with like absolutely a grain of salt because I am, I'm just out here vibing. I am out here having a great time. I am not um, a paint god or a trained professional or anything approaching either of those. I am a person who has painted some sort of pretty miniatures in my life. Uh, and who has absorbed a lot of technique through osmosis and YouTube videos, and who probably does not know nearly as much about why these techniques work as I, uh, as my confidence might project, because I am free. I frequently talk about things in this with some degree of confidence. Lord knows I have like uh, tried to teach some people how to paint miniatures, and I can only hope that I have mostly imparted uh, good and actual wisdom that I have learned and not nonsense. So again, right now we're blocking out big colors. I'm trying to block out all of this kind of bone tone that uh, Sutgar just has all over because Sutgar is a, a cool uh, shaman and warlock and badass and that means bones. That means a spellcasting focus that is just a skull in this case, uh, probably, probably, but not certainly, the skull of a saint, uh, given the D&D setting that I'm running this in, which is my uh, homebrew setting, that I uh, care quite a bit about. Um, Lord knows if we stick around in this stream for a while, uh, you're going to hear about my setting. Good grief because uh, I do tend to ramble about it. And the second thing that I want to do this stream, once I uh, lose stamina for painting, once I get tired of uh, doing something on stream that I really, really can't do very well right now, uh, I'm going to switch over to writing some stuff. And the stuff that I'm going to be writing is in-universe lore books. Um, and little mechanical perks that go along with reading those books in a Dungeons & Dragons game. So, uh, the idea being basically, uh, I run a D&D game where I care a lot about my setting, and I care a lot about, like, the lore of my world, but also I know that it's silly to ask or expect players to care about that, especially right away. I'm lucky enough to have run for a lot of players who have taken my setting very seriously, but also, um, I, that's a little bit of an anomaly and not all of my players have cared about it. And a lot of players that I run with who do care about that kind of thing care about it because I've been running in this setting with them for, uh, years and years and years and so they have osmosed this information and they have started to care about it because they've been exposed to it constantly for a long time and also because i tend to run games uh that make this information important because i figure well how do i make players so if players care about their character and sometimes the plot uh but almost never the like the world and the setting and the lore like how do i how do I, because I care about the setting and lore, how do I like encourage players to engage with that half of the game? And my answer is typically, uh, well, okay, if they care about the character and the plot, make the character and the plot very deeply tied to world lore and big setting things. Because if that's what players care about, and that's what I care about, let's mix them so that everybody's having a good time. Uh, the problem with that being, uh, if I want players to care about world information, I have to give them world information, and I could just monologue, exposit this to them, uh, but also then I'm telling it to the players, but maybe not their characters, and we kind of have to, uh, players are really hesitant to do anything that they think could be perceived as metagaming. Um, and so then players are going to be hesitant to use that information. And frankly, it's an instinct that I kind of appreciate this, like instinct to like preserve, uh, like the continuity of information from in the game and out of the game. But it means that I need a way to give information to players and their characters at the same time. 
And I can do that through like NPCs and that's typically the most interesting way to do it because then it's information that is like specifically cared about by a character in the game and the interest of characters help things like world lore be less of like neutral lore information and more like active plot information like it helps it be dramatic and kind of like the heart of what i'm doing as a dm is trying to tell dramatic stories telling things from the perspective of an npc makes things dramatic but you can't always do that and you can't always expect players to listen to your monologues or if you try to make it well okay let's not make it a monologue let's make it a conversation well what's going to make the players have that conversation what's going to make the players care about that and again we can try to involve it in the story but there's issues um which has meant in my games because i need a way to communicate this information um players in my games find a lot of books they find a lot of books about topics in my setting and that is uh how they get a lot of information about like how the world works or at least how people in the game think the world works um which works okay um it communicates the information and it like makes sure that the characters know the information the problems really come in when we start talking about okay so how do you actually like run players finding a book in your game though because uh, you have a few options and your first one is basically they find the book and then you the dm give them just the information from that book that you know is going to be plot relevant or just the or like just the bits you think that because uh, hopefully this information should be plot relevant hopefully you're providing world lore to your players to your, their characters because it is actually important in changing the way they act or the things they do like that's like the reason that we should be telling players more about the setting is like like if they really care and they're like seeking it out on their own you can just tell them random stuff but like if you are actively like putting information in their way my hope is that it's information that is relevant to what the players are doing um and Oh, what was my point with this? Um, and so you, as the DM, you can just give them those points, those key points that are the reason you're giving them this information. But if you're like me and you kind of want uh, little pieces of world lore to be the solutions to puzzles, it's going to be really clear to your players that you're giving, that you are just giving them the solution and only the solution. And like, that is what they are receiving right now. Um, and to me that's not fun and exciting uh because to me that makes it really obvious what you're giving the players and when and it kind of takes out the riddle and puzzle element of that um and so when i'm dming i like to mix it in with like other information that's less relevant and so when they find books frequently, I'll give a little monologue and I'll be like, here's the details, here's the details that, like, and I'm going to mix in stuff that's, like, directly important and I'm going to mix that in with stuff that's, like, cool, but it's not essential for them to know right now. Um, and I think that that works okay. I think that that's better. Uh, but the problem is, unless you have players uh, who are, like, wonderfully dedicated to, like, taking notes and stuff, which, again, I've had players, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for having played D&D with the people that I have. Um, uh, I'm really grateful that I played with people like the people that I play with who are so dedicated about notes, about keeping track of information and stuff. But uh, when you're monologuing, you are really relying on players to record this information uh, because you're making it accessible to them kind of just this once. Um, which I think is kind of a problem, uh, because it relies on players remembering stuff, uh, and it's requiring players to remember stuff that is, again, not, like, directly relevant to, like, the plot and narrative of what they're doing and what's happening right now, which I think is not a good type of thing to expect or encourage rote memorization of. Um... Uh, 
just because it's stuff that you haven't given players a real reason to care about yet. And so I think it's important that that kind of information is given to players in a way that they can like refer to and look back on. And if uh, you don't want to just like expect them to take notes on that, which is again, I think kind of an unreasonable expectation, um, then you have to give them something to refer back to. And uh, so what I've been doing is I've been going in and I've been writing one page executive summaries of books that exist within my setting that have information that I think is interesting or relevant to the actions of a party of player characters. And it's, frankly, very difficult and a lot of work, which is why I want to do a little bit of that on stream in a minute when y'all can hang out with me and make it all cool and exciting. I thought that both of these bracers were going to be metal, and it turns out that that is not the case. Um, here's the part where I say, hey, trust the process. I know that that's not a unique to mini painting thing, but hey, someday this is going to be this. But first, before we make all these colors pretty, uh, we have got to block them out. We have got to mark out the big locations, and so for a little while, uh, for a good part of the stream, this is the reason I'm really hesitant to paint on stream sometimes is because for most of the painting process Everything looks terrible, but eventually it's gonna be gorgeous. I promise So right now I'm marking I marked out all the bone locations and now I'm finding bits of metal and I'm using uh, What is a <gasps> that's a bird skull? That's not metal. That's more bone um, so I'm finding the big locations of metal and I'm blocking it out with uh, what is called a contrast paint. And a contrast paint is basically a wash, which is a very, very thin, very watery paint that is uh, really heavily pigmented with really fine pigments. And the idea is it, holy shit, I just spilled paint all over my mat. I need to deal with that in an urgent sense. Thanks for being here, folks. Uh, I'm gonna put this out there. Spilling, specifically a wash uh, or a contrast paint, is very much, uh, it's kind of just one of those things that happens. Uh, they tend to be left open for a little while because you apply them right out of the pot a lot, not as much like from a wet palette, uh, and so they get left open. And also they're very thin. If I had spilled over any of my other bottles of paint while it was open, uh, th with the time frame that I, in which I noticed that I had spilled it, there probably would not have been any paint uh, actually spilled because of how thick it is. I'm going to switch over to... Uh, where's chatting? Hey, look at my face for a minute and not through the uh, camera as I clean up the mess. So, I'm going to clean up this paint bottle. I'm going to... Uh, fix this up good grief can i level this is kind of a nightmare um if i can just complain for a second this is gonna be bad to clean up and also uh this is kind of expensive paint and kind of really useful paint that i use a lot i was talking about washes a contrast paint is basically a thicker wash uh a wash is going to be you paint a surface and then you uh, layer up some highlights and stuff and then you use a wash to kind of bring the color back down. It's used to darken up the shadows and to really effectively mark where on the mini those shadows should be because it sneaks into cracks and crevices and it hangs out in the low points of a miniature. Um, and it really highlights the details on the sculpt, which is nice because the details on a sculpt are frequently um, detailed enough that they are really menacing to paint by hand. And that's why we do stuff like washing and do stuff like dry brushing. Um, a contrast paint uh, is a wash, but it's a wash that's thick enough that it is going to just a little bit also color and pigment uh, the raised areas, the surface areas. So the idea being you can paint a miniature white, maybe give it a Zenithal highlighting prime, like I talked about earlier, where it's primed with, uh, first the whole mini is painted black, and then uh, you prime with an airbrush or a rattler uh, just from above using white paint or white ink to catch the highlights and kind of simulate overhead lighting. Um, 
And if you take a miniature that is either just primed white or primed with Zenithal highlighting, and then you apply a contrast paint to it, because the contrast paint is going to catch the raised areas, but then mostly the sunken bits, it basically, it paints the mini for you. You can get some really gorgeous uh, results painting a mini just with contrast paints over white or Zenithal highlighting, um, which I think is really cool. Uh, it makes this black and white contrast paint that I'm using uh, really useful because again there's a lot of gray on miniatures. Uh, this color, Basilicum Gray, I think it is gorgeous if you paint a mini with a base coat of uh, just like metallic iron and then you give it a coat of Basilicum Gray, I think it looks gorgeous. Um, it's a really, really fast and easy way to do metallics that look good. It's not what I'm doing on these minis, because I talked about earlier, I'm going to try to do non-metallic metals on these. Um, this mouse pad is never going to be the same. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go and get some more paper towels in just a second here. I'm gonna have to mask up because I'm going back into my household with, with people that don't have COVID. I have COVID right now, by the way, for all of you folks out there. Uh, hello. All right, we are just going to leave that for a second. I'll be right back. Alright, just a second here, I'll throw this back over to the main, uh, the painting camera, and we'll see how much we can salvage the vibe. That was not an awesome thing that just happened, and I appreciate your ongoing support and stuff. Those of you who have stuck around in chat through this whole catastrophe. Um... All right. Painting view. Everything still good? Yeah, okay. Let's paint. So this, I have just discovered, is a bird skull and not just a strangely painted piece of metal. That is not enough paint. That is very, very wet. Music today, by the way, is uh, the Enchanted Forest theme, uh, written by, sorry, composed by State Azure and then made available for stream use by uh, the fantastic MCDM Productions. So thank you to Matt Colville and Matt Colville's entire team because I am so very grateful to be able to um, use music like this in streams. This is a gorgeous kind of like synthy Feywild theme. That's one of the things that I like about MCDM's content, is um, they do a lot of wonderfully, like, uh, thematically uh, and setting-wise, like, varied material. Like, they do a lot of material that is, like, broadly useful to me, even though I run a very different game than uh, the kind of, like, direct vibes of Colville's stuff. Um, but... A lot of the MCDM stuff is like distinguishable and visibly distinct and like very obviously MCDM content because everything that they do, like it trends towards synth. Like everything about MCDM productions um, is uh, like it trends towards being a little bit sci-fi and a little bit weird and that is not how a lot of the stuff that I run works and trends 
But the fact that they have this unique and distinct style and aesthetic, I think is fantastic for a like uh, company that produces tabletop content. Um, and on the one hand, I'm a little bit frustrated that it is a like genre and a mood and a theme and a type of content that's really different from the vibe of the stuff that I run, because the stuff that I run is much more like obnoxious emo fantasy. Uh, of being like like period grounded and like not super high fantasy and like hidden magic and that kind of thing and so like the kind of vibe of like like synthy high magic weirdness is really different from a lot of what I run but on the other hand just the fact of like like the existence of this like highly specialized content this like highly highly specific thing that they make that is cool and awesome i'm so glad that it exists but a thousand times over i'm glad that their content exists in the form that it does i think that i'm just about finished on like the big blocks of uh horn color and i think my first priority is going to be just getting paint on every piece of this model so I'm going to go in and I'm going to introduce uh, a brown contrast paint to uh, most of the exposed bits of like cloth and fabric and stuff. Or I'm going to do brown for the fur. I'm going to do blue for this loose fabric here and for these kind of uh, uh, like hanging ribbons right there. It's going to be brown um, in between these bones because that's some kind of bandolier or um, baldric. And that's going to be some kind of leather. Uh, this down on the waist looks like horn. It looks like either a mead horn or like a uh, like a like a horn, like a horn horn for communication, for like sounding an alarm. So I'm going to give that the bone base coat. Uh, also, just real quick, while I have it so easily accessible. Um, Yeah, that's going to need an extra coat in just a second here. Just like this bone right above it needs an extra little coat. Oh, especially from below. I'm glad I flashed the camera at it like that. Uh, yeah. So the alternative to me doing this, uh, where I'm like blocking out all the colors, is that I like block out the colors and then I also layer them up and make them look pretty which frankly is in most situations uh, what I would do because it uh, helps me a lot to get the music going again um, because it helps me get past that like trust the process point because it actually starts making stuff look good sooner than later but also I think it's probably worse for like overall progress and workflow um, so let's do that first. Let's do the part where we get uh, color on all the miniature first. All right, and let's uh, use another contrast paint and pay more attention this time and hope that it goes better. For those of you who are just joining us, uh, we just experienced some problems with one of our contrast paints, which is to say, I just spilled one of our contrast paints. Okay, I'm gonna hold it the whole time, and then as soon as I'm done holding it, it's gonna be closed. I think my wet palette needs to be better hydrated. I think that I will go and do that. I mean, I can do it between painting bits, because I don't know how much longer I'm going to be painting specifically on this stream. Um, Alright, time for contrast paint. So, here's how it works. It's a heavy wash. Uh, you see right here, these kind of like hanging bits that look like fur or feathers. We're going to call it big pieces of fur, just like this kind of capelet right here. And we're going to color it with black, brown contrast paint. I might be applying this too heavily because it's turning it all like very brown in a way that like 
distinctly wants highlighted more than typically stuff does after you apply contrast paint. So what you do is get some of that paint off this brush, get a little bit more of this paint off this brush, and then see if I can just like get some of this paint off, spread it out a little more. Okay, that's a little bit better. Still needs highlighting, but uh, that's just how painting works. It's gonna want highlighted later. Um, cool, same thing for the boots. One of the other things about um, the contrast paints, in my experience, is that a lot of them are very glossy. It's one of the things that I don't like about how um, Suker's cape looks right now with the uh, the kind of yellow gold. It's just this like really glossy, gross yellow. I don't like the paint that I used for it at all. Uh, I'm going to make changing that kind of one of the priorities here. Uh, I don't like it and I'm trying to um, it looks like the this wildwood brown contrast paint that I'm using is also real glossy uh, so we're gonna want to deal with that later and part of that is gonna get helped by a um, matte varnish that will apply when the whole thing is done and then a lot of it is also going to be helped by uh, us uh, layering this up with very matte ordinary acrylic paints until this miniature is finished and just layer upon layer of acrylics which are matte in most typically applicable situations um okay that was messy like i said this is the sam relearns how to paint streams there's gonna be some messiness in here when does it look if i bring in a little bit more light. I'm going to turn this off again in just a minute so that y'all can see, but just for a second, I'm going to paint when I can see what I'm painting. Um, okay, cool. So most of my bone stuff wants another coat. Um, the tails here look okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a messy paint job, but I'm painting on stream and I'm painting for the first time in like a year or so. So we can really, we can allow for some, uh, <laughs> we can allow for some slop here today, can't we folks? If any of you are going to get grumpy at me, let me know in chat now. Yeah, it seems fine. Um, okay, cool. Other boot. Uh, hey, if anybody is still in chat, uh, how much worse does it look with the light running? Like this versus this before. Like, how gross. Uh, like, how overblown and overexposed is the actual like footage like the mini probably looks work just from a lighting perspective just because i think you can see the colors better when i have the light on and because the colors are quite gross at the moment i imagine it would look worse but also just from like a like video production standpoint how bad does this look it's not bad okay in that case i'm just gonna leave this light on for a little while and see how it goes and thank you very much for staying in chat, Mars. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being here. I hope that you are having a good time. Uh, and I hope that anybody uh, filtering in and out or anybody watching this VOD later uh, is having a good time. This is my first time. I Okay, here's the deal. I streamed for like two hours yesterday. I'm going to leave the VOD up on Twitch uh, because I think it's funny, but I'm not going to port it over to YouTube. Um, technically my first stream since I last did this like two years ago <coughs> was last night, <coughs> but 
last night when I was streaming, I had my microphone turned off. So I streamed for um, about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, uh, with a consistent one viewer uh, watching my work. Um, and apparently the that one viewer didn't care that there was no audio, so I guess I'm just really handsome, is what I'm choosing to believe. Um, maybe? Uh... Yeah, so that's my that was my actual uh, first stream back, but uh, we're not counting that one because the audio was off and nobody was there, and um, it was just me talking about in-game lore books for a while. God, I never finished my little chat earlier about in-game lore books. My whole point was that um, that if you want players to find books and you want those books to have actually like information written in them and you want that information to be a mix of plot relevant and puzzle relevant information with information that is not those things but is just kind of cool um that there isn't any substitute for just doing a whole fucking lot of work <laughs> because the unfortunate reality of um uh the unfortunate reality of uh, uh, having your players find books is that uh, if you want there to be an actual text to those books, you have to actually write them. And so that has been my ongoing project is to actually write a bunch of in-game uh, like summaries of in-game lore books, which are just little one-page summaries with information that I can give to players uh, when they find a book so that I can teach them and their characters about a cool new facet of the world. And then also, I've been trying to give those lore books small little mechanical buffs, like little mini feats or mini perks that they get for reading that book. Uh, a little bit Skyrim, but I'm trying to give the feats, uh, like, not just have them be like skill books, but giving them like just a little bit of like interest and a unique ability. And they're not like powerful abilities. They're just small little things that are flavorful for what the book was about. Um, and then I'm saying that a player can have a number of these little book bonuses, like, active at a time, uh, equal to their intelligence modifier to kind of tie in books to intelligence, and then also um, uh, give players more of a reason to pick up intelligence, because right now intelligence is, like, pretty commonly considered just, like, the 5th edition dump stat, like, why put your points in intelligence? Like, it makes sense from, like, a character building perspective, like, I would like to play a smart character, but uh, in a mechanical sense, like, if you're not playing a wizard or an artificer, it typically doesn't really make sense mechanically to put points into intelligence. Um, and it, it also takes a very, like, particular kind of game that you are running uh, for the proficiencies under intelligence to be useful in a direct way in a Dungeons & Dragons game. You run into issues of, like, like, your DM has to be, like, sending you on, like, particular kinds of adventures before, like arcana and history and religion are skills that are going to like make a meaningful impact on your ability to accomplish things as a player which is kind of what makes you feel cool about be building a DD character in a certain way so lore books uh as i've been working on them are kind of like the basic idea of writing a bunch of like executive summaries of in-world text so that players can like find out information about your setting in an interesting way and then I'm trying to tie in like a little bit of a mechanical bonus to make it feel better to be the kind of character who would read a book. And then also to give players a mechanical incentive to uh, like actually pursue this uh, system and to pursue lore in the setting, uh, even if they're not super invested in like what that lore is right away. This whole thing is me being like, I care a lot about the lore of the setting. How do I make that a fun thing to my players for them to pursue? And not just like uh, an obligation or a thing that I am pushing or foisting onto my players. Um, you know, uh, in just a second here, I'm probably going to uh, not switch over permanently, but just because I'm talking about it a whole lot, I'll switch over to one of the lore books that I've already written, and we can uh, just give it a little peek. Uh, just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about, those of you who are hanging out. Uh, yeah, and then in a little bit here, when I do get tired of trying to relearn how to paint live on camera, um, 
I might switch over and actually work on like writing uh, one of those lore books and then asking y'all if you're hanging out in chat, asking y'all for input and advice or neat ideas. Uh, if anybody want in chat wants to have in-game characters named after them, fucking shout it out because I will absolutely make you permanent important facets of my game world lore because I am bad at naming things and I love hanging out with y'all cool people in chat. So, for the moment, we paint. What I'm doing right now is I'm taking the uh, uh, bone that I base coated earlier and I'm putting brown contrast paint on it. The idea being I want the this base coat, this like very dark uh, beige, to be the, the dark layer that I build up from with highlights of color later. And so right now I'm taking what started out as a much uh, like lighter, brighter color than I expected and a much lighter and brighter color than I want for my base coat. And I'm hitting with this brown wa uh, sorry, brown contrast paint, which is browning up and bringing down the color of all of the paint, but then it's also sinking into those textures and recessed bits and highlighting those details with like particular darkness. Like if you look at this, suddenly you can like really see the ropes and stuff uh, that are on this bit of horn. Uh, which is going to be useful later for when I actually paint them and kind of like pull out that texture. Uh, so this is right now just basically more base coating. This is me saying I want my base coat to be a little bit of a different color and I'm giving it a little bit of detail just that this thing starts looking a little bit more like a cohesive thing uh, without going in and doing all the highlights and stuff because that is not a valuable thing to do this early in the process because we are still at the trust the process, I swear it'll look pretty later stage of painting. So, good grief. That's kind of where we're at. We've put brown onto these boots. We've done a lot of the uh, base coating for the bone and horn pieces. Uh, we've given a little bit of texture to the hair. Um, in a second, what I'm going to want to do is uh, probably start to blue up the details on the clothes. This hanging bit of fabric right here, these fabric like ribbons right here. The problem being those ribbons are kind of above pieces of leather and other clothing that I should probably hit first. So. Ooh, maybe I'll change the cloak that I hate so much. Maybe that's what I do first. What kind of color are we thinking for the cloak here? How do we feel about green? Green or... Blue. But if I hit it with blue right now and it is so, so yellow, it'll just end up green anyways. Which, uh, depending on how we feel we should go with this, might be a problem. <laughs> Any color preferences from the chat? I'm gonna try the blue, and it might be a horrible mistake, but it might be cool. And we close the contrast paint, because we do not need another spillage incident on the same stream. I think I probably wanted a bigger brush for this. Definitely wanted more paint.
Huh. This is weird now, because it didn't cover it up, but it didn't really blend either. Uh, what it is now is very blue with some like mottled patches of yellow that very much shines through thin pieces of where the blue is like not really settling well. And what that looks like is strange. And what this might need eventually is just a solid coat of real non-contrast paint uh, over the top of it. We're gonna see. This is looking really muddy, is how this looks, just in the cosmic sense. Um, all right, cool beans. This is what we have for now. This is what we're working on for now. A little bit more wildwood and We are just trying to get this to sink into the recesses and the details of like the chest with the baldric, with the bandolier, with everything that's hanging out in here around the uh, bits that we're going to bring out and make like brightly colorful. So this is kind of us are using our generic like leather tone and filling in all the little gaps with a generic leather so that instead of being black or white, if we miss bits those missed bits are gonna be leathery brown and I have just done something that is quite bad and quite taboo and quite bad for my equipment right now which is I um, collected more paint to put onto my palette with the brush that I'm actually using to paint uh, which is mostly bad because it's putting a ton of pigment onto your brush which is good for like damaging it in the long-term sense um, particularly when you do what I do which is misjudge the depth of that paint and stick it all the way up to um, where the bristles end and you get the like the metal binding, which I forget the name of. I knew the names of these things at one point in my life, uh, and I no longer do. Um, but and if you do that, the uh, paint is kind of like sinking into the pieces of the uh, brush bristles that are responsible for the actual bristles staying where they are and pointing in the same direction, which is pointed in the direction that creates a pointy tip to your paintbrush. And so what I've just done is put paint down in that bit and when and if it starts to dry like that, it's going to push the bristles in my paintbrush apart and make it harder and harder for this brush to ever like hold a uh, point again, which is not awesome. Uh, but this is information hour with Sam and my brushes are already quite fried and this is zero pressure relearn to paint chill time so I'm not too worried about it although I am gonna wash this brush in just a second just to avoid what I can of that problem um, yeah What I should probably do is go and run that underwater in just a second. But like I said, I'll do that in just a second. Um, hey, you know what, y'all? I am going to follow my heart and not my, like, technique brain. And I'm going to uh, highlight some of these bones just because I think that's going to be fun. Um, so I'm going to take the same color that I used before that I, like, dulled down using brown I'm gonna water it down a bit and then I'm gonna use it to highlight stuff so I'm looking for big flat surfaces mostly and mostly on like bits of this that would be exposed to lots of light so like top bits and I'm painting it over again with the very bright color that I mellowed out a minute ago and I say very bright this is still a very dull kind of brownie beige this is not like me highlighting like 
the shiniest bits of sunlight. These are me, this is me highlighting out like broad areas of light contact. This is me bringing up things that aren't like the most shadowy part of the bone, which is what the um, uh, remaining pieces of the like uh, mellowed out brown beige should now represent. Oh goodness, how are we doing chat? I'm feeling a little bit sleepy, but I'm happy. I'm happy to be doing this again. It's been a long while and I have a lot of fun streaming and I have a lot of fun writing and recording stuff for YouTube, which is also something that I'm trying to do more. The lore book stuff that I've talked about a little bit on this stream and then on the one last night that didn't have audio, so nobody could tell I was talking about that. Um, I've been talking about that a bit, and that's something I'd like to make a YouTube video about, because I think this idea of like tying small mechanical bonuses to um, in-universe lore books is cool and effective, and I haven't seen a lot of people doing it before. And one of the problems with it is that it's very setting specific, and it's very high labor to do it for your own games and settings, um, which I can see being a barrier to a lot of DMs, especially DMs who like don't care as much about world lore stuff as I do, which is super valid. Like it's a system that I'm only developing and only using um, because this is something that I care about. Um, and so there is this like very large barrier to using it on top of just it not being a system for everybody. And so uh, we'll see if anybody other than me actually thinks it's cool. We'll see if my players think it's cool before anything else. But um, I would really love to introduce it to other people. I would really love to like make a YouTube video about it, to talk about this idea, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that, that could be a lot of fun. So I'm going to make a video about the travel rules that I use, because that's kind of a rite of passage for Dungeons & Dragons YouTubers. I feel like every Dungeons & Dragons YouTuber has done a video about how they run travel. Um, and then I'm going to run, uh, maybe make a video talking about this kind of first level adventure module that I've started to run that I'm really, really happy with. Um, and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. I don't have like the kind of life schedule right now where I can really um, uh, keep a regular stream schedule, like where I can be like, hey, every Tuesday and Thursday night, I'm gonna stream for three hours. Like that's just kind of not where my life is at scheduling wise right now. Um, in the next year or so, not in the next year or so, in the next couple of weeks when I start my school year again, I'll be taking classes, I will hopefully have a part-time job uh, on campus, I will be um, working on research, because right now I'm working on research with a professor over the summer, in a few weeks that'll be over, but then when that's over, I'll be doing my own personal research for my undergrad thesis uh, in the communication department of my school. Uh, that I'm going to be researching and writing for. Um, so what I'm trying to say is I'm going to be busy this year. Uh, and so instead of trying to keep a super regular stream schedule, what I'm kind of hoping to do is to keep a regular but relaxed schedule of YouTube uploads. Um, okay, this is kind of coming along. This is very much a learning how to paint again miniature, but I also don't hate it. And it's a learning how to paint again miniature more than a learning how to paint in the first place miniature, um, which I think is good. But uh, the idea being, I'm gonna try to stream when I can, and I'm gonna start to upload vid uh, VODs to YouTube. And then I'm also gonna work on some like scripted YouTube content, because I think um, some of the more interesting uh, stuff that I have to say about like things like Dungeons and Dragons are things that are better suited to scripted kind of talking head content like a Dale Kingsmill or a Matt Colville um, and I would really love to share my ideas in that way so hopefully that's something that I can actually manage to accomplish and then I can come on to stream 
and I can hang out with you awesome people. Oh, hello, Fire Ice at all. Uh, I did not see you there. I don't know how long ago you sent that message, but hi, and thank you for coming by. How are you doing today? Oh, that was way too bright. I just added, uh, I'm working right now on the kind of like central belt bit of bone, this like skull of some sort right here. And I just hit it with a very, very bright uh, splash of bone color that it was not ready for. But we can dull that back down a little bit. Oh, I hope you're doing good, Fire Ace All. And I hope I didn't miss your message by too terribly far. I've been kind of engrossed in monologuing and stuff uh, and kind of filling the air for a while here. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, trying to bring up this colors in a minute here what I am almost ready to do is kind of like uh, graduate from this color of highlights uh, which I've been applying in like very thin coats to try to get like a little bit of a kind of transition to get like a little bit of a blend from the uh, previous tone up to this one but what I'm gonna be ready to do in just a second here is graduate up to the next lighter color um, yeah Oh, good grief. I'm also going to do take a little peek at the stream stuff. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to look at the list of, like, Twitch viewers and see, like, hey, lots of people have kind of cycled in and out. I don't know where people are coming from. I'm going to assume my Instagram, but uh, also, I don't recognize any of the usernames, so maybe I'm just eminently discoverable and also not the most exciting person to listen to talk. So, um, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> funky funky. This is kind of neat. This is too small of a brush to use for contrast paint, decidedly. That's better. Oh, good grief, this is a messy mini. Well, you know what? We do what we can, and frankly, just having color on a mini at the table, I think is neat. I think people appreciate the effort, and I know I appreciate just like the visual change of just a mini on the table, having like any paint on it. Like even just being like uh, primed with Zenithal highlights, I think is such a dramatic, uh, like, I'm not going to call it like a strict improvement, but just like it changes the vibe so much. Uh, just to like have a miniature with even like the single coat of paint on it. I think is really neat um, I feel really bad that I missed this uh, chat message from fire ice earlier um, But I'll work on it and I'll pay attention what I need frankly uh, It would be silly for any like reasonably side to size twitch thing but for the the vibe of my streams right now what I need is some kind of chat notifications that I get a little ping a little a little beep because uh, Lord knows right now I do not have my eyes trained on the chat oh good grief uh, yeah this is okay so this is maybe our progress for the day um, I am not madly in love, but I also do not hate her. And I think I like the vibe of the cloak a little bit better now, a little green, a little blue, but I do think it needs like a heavy another coat on it. Um, yeah, so that's what we've been painting. Um, It might be time to switch it up a little bit. It might be time for me to go and fill my water bottle and uh, go pee and take a little break and then come back and we'll do a little bit of typing chatty stuff. How do we feel? Uh, let me get this out of my face real quick. Uh, get the magnifying glass out of here. 
finished cleaning up. Uh, while we're still here, I'm just gonna keep being like, I fucking love this Valkyrie. Uh, that's all. That's all I have to say. Also, my Infinity Miniatures, I'm quite pleased with. Um, and yeppers, for now. That's all the painting I think I've got in me. Uh, I'm gonna try to pace myself a little bit and not push myself if I start feeling like really critical of myself because I kind of want painting to be a thing that I love and that brings me joy and not just a thing that I use to create cool stuff for D&D. I um, feel like lately I've maybe been putting a weird and not super productive pressure on myself to create. Uh, I've had COVID the last little while and um, since I've been self-isolating, I've been kind of placing this pressure on myself for like, all right, you're locked in your room. Um, you should make, uh, you should make something. You should uh, be productive. You should like find some way for this um, uh, time spent in isolation to be sp time spent uh, being productive, like doing productive stuff. Um, and I'm trying to get a little bit better at not putting that pressure on myself and creating either uh, because it's something that I have uh, committed to, like if I put myself on a YouTube schedule, then creating like because it's I enjoy the pattern and the repetition of it, and then also just like creating because it brings me joy, because I'm not a professional, because I don't do these things as my job, and so I'm trying to do better about uh, if they're not my jobs, they're hobbies. If they're hobbies, they should be bringing me joy. Um, there's a little glimpse into the psychology of Sam. When you put me in a situation where I just monologue, um, I'm going to get weird about it with relative uh, quickness. So, um, yeah, uh, let's hang out and let's uh, tidy up a little bit. Let's see how much uh, ink there is still like wet and damp and raw on my mat. Okay, there's a lot of it. Um, we're gonna take one of these clean paper towels over here that I didn't end up using, and we're gonna put that out there. Um, while we're here, just like on the VOD and stuff, uh, on the VOD, I don't know any of my language, my lingo, I'm not cool. Uh, all right, paintbrush that needs cleaned, paintbrush that needs cleaned, paintbrush that needs cleaned. These ones are gonna go in just a minute. These paintbrushes can go back to living in the paintbrush prison. Uh, this bad boy can go on the um, paint shelf. Palette can go back below magnifying glass, can go back to living far away where the magnifying glass likes to live. Oh, goodness. I hope this isn't a terrible thing for me to be doing on the stream on the stream. This is maybe something that I should have been like, hey, we're going to take our first break, and then I can put the uh, stream onto uh, a break. Uh, put us onto the pause screen and edit it out for the VOD. But I like hanging out with y'all, and if I'm going to keep monologuing y'all might as well be able to hear it because lord knows why else i'm doing all this stuff spoken out loud oh good grief mm. <laughs> neat neat all right i am going to uh so, progress for today's stream. Pro progress for today's stream. Progress for the painting half of things. Uh, we have... Let's toss back in paint view for just a second here. All right. We have put in base coats on most of... Ooh, is this going to focus? I put us. I took us out of the like proper paint mode. Uh, we have put base coats on a lot of Sucre the Vile. Uh, and then Sam has gotten a little bit frustrated with how it's turning out, and I have not wanted to just do the, like, trusting in the process thing that this is gonna improve in things, and then 
we have kept moving. We've pivoted. Uh, like I said a moment ago, what we're going to do now is uh, switch over double Sam into kind of a uh, writing mode because the other thing that I wanted to do during today's stream is I wanted to do a little bit of writing of lore books for my D&D home setting. I have been doing a thing where I've been trying to uh, fill out specifically for the new D&D game that I'm running starting at first level. I'm trying to write uh, like one-page executive summaries of like in-universe lore books that my players have been finding because I like running a game where this kind of um, world lore is the answer to like uh, riddles and puzzles and where it's the solution to problems that the players face. Uh, and to communicating that information to players in an interesting way, I've been trying to write um, dramatic uh, executive summaries of uh, the stuff that they're gonna find. So, let me switch over, let me show off what one of those looks like, and then I'm gonna take a five minute break, I'm gonna go pee, I'm gonna get some water, and then I'm gonna come back and we are all going to work on putting together some of these books. Here's the most finished one so far. So this is The Traveler's Path, written by Omolara of the, er of the Ercolan Aksu. It is written in Ilian, and it takes 12 hours for a player to read. And came before the High Saint, a wanderer whose name had been known east of those great mountains. For in her time she had saved many who might otherwise have been claimed by the untamed wilds. Those who journey at my side will know no hunger that the wilds will not sate, nor chill that their fire cannot drive away. Yours is a path true through the wild and dark. And so rose Ashir the Traveler, as servant of Nimia who is Nim, and vessel of her soul. The Book of Journeys, 14.4, The Oath of the Wandering Saint. So this is an excerpt from the in-universe uh, holy setting, that, uh, the in-universe holy text that I have for my game. Um, and then the, uh, so this is kind of a quote, this is an excerpt from the book, this is the eye catch, this is the thing to like make you care. If a player is like sifting through their papers and notes, this is the piece that they see and it has like, it is uniquely formatted in some of the other books. This is a picture, like for the book about money and currency and stuff, it's a picture of the coins, it's a scanned image of the coins that I use for my Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, the idea being it's visually distinct so a player can find one of these easily, and it's catchy. It has some little thing to engage you. Like, for the pictures, it's the visuals. For the written ones, it's just a little bit of interesting fiction. And then the actual text of the book happens. This relatively short text describes itself as an excerpt from the author's complete work, titled Twilight Folk in the Land of Stone, a comprehensive collection of Ordinian fairy stories. In keeping with both the content and pacing of that title, The Traveler's Path is a ponderous essay on the myths and stories surrounding Saint Ashir, accompanied by transcripts of those myths. Saint Ashir is described as a frequent trickster and sometimes warrior, devoted to the service of High Saint Nimia who is Nim, and the protection of the innocent. They are patron saint of those who travel in the wilds, a title earned for defending the survivors of the Deep Gate Siege as they fled west across the Iron Tooth Mountains. Using powerful magic and a deep knowledge of the land, Ashir guided 1,000 citizens safely through the Iron Teeth, all the while being pursued by the dreadwolf Safsir. Omalara places particular focus on Ashir's seeming origin in pre-Ilian myths and fairy stories, describing the presence of the figure in oral and runic traditions understood to predate the exalted march of the saints. She posits that this is representative of one of two possible phenomena. That Ashir's legends are representative of the mythic syncretism and the incorporation of an existing heroic figure into, Ilian, into the canon of Ilian religious history, or that these legends are rather representative of a practical syncretism and the incorporation of a living hero into the service of the saints. The second is far more consistent with traditional religious beliefs, but raises new questions about Ashir's life. If they had lived long enough already to become a mythic figure, and had already demonstrated the feats of magic described in their mythology, did their magic precede their sainthood? So, this is... To be frank, one of the more finicky 
and uh, noodly of the lore books, where, like, the actual information contained here, there's some drama, there's some, like, tension, there's, like, a story here, but there's also a lot of, like, kind of loose rambling, and that's because this book is kind of meant to specifically target players who care about the religion of the setting, and this is one of the main central tensions of the religion. And this book as a whole is also meant to fit very cleanly into this first edition adventure that I've been running, The Red Friend Raiders, which is all about the dungeon in this game, is the tomb of Ashir, the tomb of this saint described in the book. And one of the main tensions of the uh, setting, as it, like as this local area exists, is the religious tension between like the old faith that Saint Ashir was a figure in before they were a saint and then the conflict of that versus Ashir as Saint Ashir the Traveler and the idea being both of these are ideas that are supported by characters in this opening adventure and there are practical implications of this conflict for the like specifically the puzzles and traps that are in the dungeon are informed by this contents of this book. So this book is going to hook players who care about setting stuff, religious stuff, uh, which I'm lucky enough to have it for the party that I'm running this for right now, players who care about this stuff a lot. But just that everybody has a reason to be like excited about finding one of these books, it has the immediate effect upon reading of marking locations on your map that are relevant to the story, and the ongoing effects that you have a bonus to survival, just any survival check, you have a plus one, and that you have a plus five to intelligence checks regarding the contents of this check. So this second bit basically represents the idea of like, a player can make a die roll to see if they know about a, like a specific detail about a topic they are sort of educated in. And then the plus one to survival checks uh, is a like specific and sort of small but very noticeable buff to a different element of your character that I think is a good little incentive for different kinds of players to care more and more about this lore book stuff. Uh, you'll notice that for the book about coins and currency, the ongoing effects you still have the plus five to intelligence checks regarding coins, currency, and the other contents of this text, but you also have a 10% discount of the purchasing of items that cost more than a crown, a crown being a gold coin, and a gold coin in my setting is worth a lot more money than gold in 5th edition, so this is on very expensive purchases you get a discount because this is a book on saving, haggling, and contracting, along with traditions and superstitions related to Ilian coinage. And so it gives you a little bit of a reason to care if you're a mechanically focused care player, and it gives you a reason to care if you are a narratively invested character, and as a DM it gives me a way to mechanically reward you for engaging a lot with the setting in the world, because that makes you a player that I appreciate a lot, and that I can like interact with in cool ways that I can't do otherwise, and this gives me a way to kind of like reward you in game and in world for that kind of thing so um the traveler's path is pretty much finished like this is one that i would print out and i would give to players um silver and gold i need to detail out kind of the immediate effects a little bit better um but the actual text should be mostly finished um i would like to when I get back from my bathroom break, I would like to work on this one right here, Steal as Quick as Wit. Because the idea here uh, is I would like... All right. Uh, I'm going to do this when I get back. But I have something neat and unique about this one that you can probably see if you're looking at your screens right now. Uh, but I'll be back in just a second to talk a little bit more about what I want to accomplish with this. Uh, back in five, y'all. Talk to you soon.
Hey, I'm back. Hello. So, here's what I want to do with this lore book. So, we've talked a little bit about what these darn things are. They're books you read, and not only do they contain interesting, dramatically written lore, they also include little mechanical bonuses that you get. And I am taking this as my opportunity to introduce a set of mechanics that I have been dying to for years. This is a book off the DMs Guild by Clan Crafter Heralding. I love this. This is a PDF document, wonderfully formatted, beautiful, and it is nothing but a list of unique attacks for different weapons. Taking different weapons that are present in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, but are very mechanically uh, similar to each other, and it is a set of unique abilities that go with each of these. So when you attack with a club, um, rather than just making a normal attack, because you are using a club, you have the option to make a daze attack. And a daze attack does less damage, it does one plus your strength modifier and damage, but it forces a constitution saving throw that takes away their abilities to use reactions. It's a small little bonus. It's a choice that you have to make, because there is a, an upside and a downside to making an attack like this. But it makes your club feel a little bit cooler and it makes your club feel a little bit more like a club and I think that that is rad but on the other hand I kind of don't want to just send this book out to players and be like hey everybody gets all the extra attacks from this all the um all the different fighting styles they come with these unique bonuses now everything is suddenly more complicated and more powerful like these feel awesome, but they feel like things that should be little rewards. They should be like lesser feats that you get as like a reward for like, you save a sword master. And they teach you a new technique for your long sword. Where's the... I, I must have skipped it. Uh, they teach you a new technique for the short sword. You can make a remise. When you make a melee attack with your short sword and miss, you can redirect the strike with a swift motion, re-rolling the attack once and taking the result of the second roll. So you can take your... Um, uh, and then this takes away your ability to do reactions and your ability to move. So I think this is just like, these are cool little perks. They're cool little decisions you have to make. They have upsides and downsides. And above all else, I just think they make different weapons more distinct. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these abilities and I'm going to make a unique set of lore books where the ongoing benefit of those books is that you can use the techniques for certain weapons. Steel as Quick as Wit is the first of these that I'm going to write, and it is going to be a fiction story. It's going to be essentially a novel, which will be new to the setting that people are writing novels. Um, and it is going to be about a, uh, a lesser noble who is a courtly duelist. And for reading this book, players are going to uni learn unique abilities for the following equipment. A rapier, a small sword, a paring dagger, and a buckler, which are like the tools of a court duelist. They are the, the weapons that are used by the characters in this story, and I think that's really cool. Uh, and so what this story needs to be is it needs to be, um, it needs to hint at there being cool fiction. It needs to hint that this is an exciting story, or a story with a particular tone and style and mood. Um, and then it need and it needs to include hints to these weapons. And that's what we're gonna write right now. Uh, so, Steel as Quick as Wit by Cortinius Scriptanus, uh, which is a dumb name on purpose. It's a pen name, and it is the pen name of the kind of person who would write an adverb-heavy adventure novel. And this person who's writing an adverb-heavy adventure novel in a, uh... Uh, one of the three cities, particularly in the city of Parnassus, exists this writer who is writing pulpy adventure novels. And these pulpy adventure novels are going to be a way for players in my game to learn new techniques for rapier, small sword, paring dagger, and butt buckler, as they are present in the Martial Arms Training Manual, which is a book that I did not write. It is a homebrew text by this person right here, who I think is really rad. So, how are we going to write this? Uh, Steals Quick as Wit, an adverb heavy adventure novel. Uh, Steal as quick as wit. Um, uh, details the of the 
fictional um, noble who needs a name. If anybody has the name for a uh, either, uh, yeah, for a if anybody has the uh, a name idea for a Latin sounding noble person, uh, Latin being like like uh, like Roman, like if somebody has an idea for a Roman sounding noble, I I would love that because I do not have any names in my brain right now. <clears throat> Um, we're gonna call this X for now. Maybe we should have started with the name. Uh, X is a a lesser noble whose family um so okay um of the fictional noble. Ooh, here's the problem. This country in the free marches where I decided that uh, this story was written doesn't have nobles. Like it has elected officials and it has powerful merchants, but there's not a like class of landed, like landed nobility. It does not have so. It's going to be a story that takes place in like proper old Ilya. Okay, we can we can make that work. Um, in that case, the name can be much more high fantasy typical. Let's see if I actually have a name list in here. This is my one note where I keep my notes about um, stuff. Okay, um, Everard. It could be said more than time. Okay. Um, Atelia Tibers. Uh, yeah, let's go with that for now. Um, um, Atelia is a lesser no, a lesser Ilian noble. Um, oh goodness. Uh, Lesser Ilian noble seeks to, uh, and here's, okay, here's a little preface. I'm going to be doing writing on stream. One of the reasons that I'm writing on stream is because I'm really bad about when I'm writing. Uh, I'm not good at just make a draft and accept that most of what I'm writing is going to be bad at first. What I do is I write a sentence and then I say, great, now I need to revise that and I'll get rid of half the sentence and I'll rewrite it and I'll read it and I won't like it and I'll erase it and I will keep fine tuning one sentence at a time until I like that single sentence and frankly I think that's a problem I think it gets in the way of me doing a lot of writing I think it's a bad habit I would like to break and here's the thing about me writing on stream when I'm writing on stream when people are looking at me there is a pressure to move things along and to keep working and to keep writing and so uh it's a pressure to not spend a million years revising every sentence. So, here's my preface. A lot of what I write here is going to look like garbage at first. I'm going to come back and I'm going to fix it, because that's what writers do, and I'm going to try to be a writer. So, let's see how it works. Atelia is a lesser Ilian noble who seeks to improve the standing um, Uh, um, political standing of her family. Um, to this end, um, okay, um, uh, okay, she serves the saints, um, as a spy and as a okay she serves the saints oh god um like i said putting myself under pressure okay uh atelia what does she do uh lesser Lee noble seeks to improve the political standing of our family she serves the saints as a spy and um you know what let's just do brainstorming first let's turn this into uh brainstorming uh she's a cool spy um she foils plots of her family's enemies 
Uh, she does a lot of duels. She does a lot of dueling. Okay. Um, okay, an adverb heavy adventure novel. Uh, okay. Let's write a quote from this. Atelia's. Made. Danced in the sunlight. Uh. <laughs> Um, the flash of light. Again, adverb heavy adventure novel. What is the sound like? What is the feel of this story? Uh, um, uh, in a flash. Uh, but he was no... And his blade uh god well maybe writing on stream is not going to speed me up maybe it's going to make me wildly self-conscious okay until his blade danced in the sunlight leaping towards the count's throat uh with a Uh, with a flash, he was no, um, uh, oh goodness, no, god, this is, okay, uh, maybe this isn't, I really thought this was gonna work and be helpful, uh, but it might just make me freeze up. Okay. Steel's quick as wit. Tilly's blade danced in the sunlight, leaping towards the Count's throat with a flash, but he was no more stranger to the dueling than she was. Blade. Hers. Um... Um, are there two S's when you write sus? There are! That's good to know. Uh, okay, his repost was no more was no more enthusiastic. Uh, okay, but he was no more a stranger to the dueling grounds than she was, and his blade rose to meet hers in a casual parry. Um, his repost was no more enthusiastic. A probing strike meant to suss out. Um, uh, the younger and defenses. Uh, okay. Okay, there's, you know, there's, there's a quote. That'll be fine. That'll work for something at some point. Um, no more enthusiastic. A probing strike makes meant to suss out the younger woman's own defenses. Okay. Um... Okay, Atelier's blade uh, danced in the sunlight, leaping towards the Count's throat in a f uh, with a flash. But he was no more strange to the dueling grounds than she was, and the blade of his dagger rose. Uh, the blade of his dagger. Um, and the blade of his dagger rose to meet hers in a casual parry. His repost was no more enthusiastic, a probing strike. Um, dude. A little more than suss out the younger woman's own defenses. Um, okay, cool. An adverb heavy adventure novel. Steel as quick as wit details the exploits of the fictional noble Atelier Tibers. Um, a lesser. 
um, family in the High Ilian Empire. Um, must fight for their survival and advancement. Okay, the Tibers must fight for their survival and advancement in, a, uh, in the face of countless unknown enemies. Attilia herself. Okay, so. An ad for Peppy Adventure. Novel steal as quick as wit details the exploits of the fictional... Now I have to make sure that my actual quotes are adverb heavy, though. Because to me, adverb heavy, like, means it, like, suggests a very certain vibe um, in terms of, like, the... Like, to me, adverb heavy, like, implies a certain kind of of prose and pulp and now I just have to make sure that what I'm writing actually feels like an excerpt from that kind of like pulpy adverb heavy maybe could have used another revision kind of fantasy genre uh which uh th I feel like this is kind of like it feels crowded it feels messy but we're going to see how it feels at the end. Okay, an adverb heavy adventure novel, steal as quick as wit, details the exploits of fictional noble Attilia Tibers, a lesser family in the High Alien Empire. A lesser family in the High Alien Empire, the Tibers must fight for their survival and advancement in the face of countless unknown enemies. Attilia herself, uh, is. Okay, uh, Atelier herself is the swashbuckling young head of the Tiber's household. Uh, after being orphaned at a young age. Again, pulp adventure fantasy. Okay, after being orphaned at a young age, um, the world of court intrigue. At varying times, been spy, lover, commander, and most, uh, been spy, lover, and commander. But above all, uh, Atelia is renowned as a court duelist. <sighs> okay, wielding a uh, buckler and small sword. Uh, it is has cowed uh, opponents in the name of her house and okay um Cool. So that's kind of the vibe I'm going for. And then, like, you read this book about this, like, excellent court duelist, and it teaches you some of these techniques for, for rapier, for small sword, for pairing dagger, and for buckler. Um, uh, a unique for the duelist fighting style. I kind of feel like I might want to ice the immediate effects, especially for this one, but maybe the other ones too. I'm just not feeling it today. We're going to see how that goes. Okay. Until his blade danced in the sunlight, leaping towards the Count's throat with a flash. But he was no more stranger to the dueling ground than she was, and the blade of his dagger rose to meet hers in a casual parry. His approach was no more enthusiastic at probing strike back to do little than suss out the, woman's own, the younger woman's own defenses. Um... 
what if we made this the eye catch? What if we made this? I don't know why there is this hanging indent. I'm sure that's something that I did for a previous one of these texts. Okay, align and indent, indentation options. Hanging, get the hell out of here. Uh, and then this doesn't need uh, an attribution because this is just the text itself. No, 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 to there. That should unfuck the formatting a little bit. Um, okay, so what I really want here is for this little uh, bit of fiction, though, to end with some kind of twist. So, um, says something fucking snarky. That's what it goes right there. And then, um,. Atilia thinks about the twist of this particular little bit of fiction. All right. Um, yeah, out of heavy adventure novel steals quickest wit details the exploits of the fictional noble Atilia Tibers, a lesser family in the High Alien Empire. The Tibers must fight for their survival and advancement in the face of countless unknown enemies. Atilia herself is the swashbuckling young head of the Tibers household. After being an orphan at a young age, Tilia adapted quickly to the world of court intrigue. She has a very time to been spy, lover, and commander. Um, but above all, Atilia is renowned as a court duelist. Wielding buckler and small sword, she has cowed uh, countless opponents in the name of her house and her sponsors. Okay, uh, that's the quick version. Apparently I'm bad at writing on stream, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to block out some... Um... So this next one is going to be, uh, what's a good title for a book about a knight dying? Um, you know what? What if I just stole one of my other pieces of fiction? Okay, The Beast of Branton, make a copy. This is going to be the lore book to teach you about, uh, the longsword, the, uh, short sword so in other words this is the book people want because this is the one that covers all the weapons people default to what are some good uh and then this will be good for we'll make this the maybe the protection uh school like protection or uh defense <laughs> It might be defense. Uh, no, knights are going to be protection, and then, like, uh, saints are going to be defense. That's what this is going to be. Okay, so, um... Cool. And the actual weapons, this is going to be good for... Because these are knightly weapons, and the knightly weapons in the setting are, uh, longsword and shortsword. So longsword is going to teach you half-sorting, uh... You can slip the blade through a gap in your defenses. Okay, so this sneaks past armor but does less damage. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Uh, and then sh for short sword, okay, we already looked at this. These are both pretty damn good abilities. So uh, this is a book that we might make more inaccessible or just like harder to find. Also because I'd like to encourage, part of the reason I want to introduce these unique abilities is I want to encourage players to uh, use weapons outside of the default short sword, long sword, uh, which is why like, hey, this uh, Steel as Quick as Wit makes you really good at using a small sword, which is like a weapon I don't see, but I fucking love small swords, just like uh, historically and from a stage combat perspective, because by the way, hey y'all, I lightly dabble in stage combat stuff. Let me, uh, look, I'm a, oh, okay, let's log into that one. Apparently we're having internet issues. Um, 
Wow, okay. See, I'm a cool I'm a cool stage combat person. Look at me. Look at look at me in a fight in a sword fight. Uh small swords are really cool and I love them from like a stage combat perspective, even though they're really fucking hard to make look good. Uh I think small swords are really rad. I want to see more of them in my D D games, and my way of doing that is uh creating a little bonus perk that goes along with uh fighting with a small sword to give people an incentive to use them. Uh but we need some secondaries, so probably just a typical shield, uh, but there's not a unique ability for the shield in this book, which makes sense. So a knight probably wouldn't have a spiked shield, and tower shields and uh, wall shields are both probably mostly good for, uh, like, those are probably going to go in the saints, because the whole saints thing is, like, club and the biggest shield you've ever seen, or, like, mace or, like, morning star and the biggest shield you've ever seen. So that'll probably go, uh, for, uh, tower shield will probably go for the saints. There's no reason that I need, like, four unique weapons for every one of these books, but... I do want to give a little bit more interest than just the, uh, the swords. So, is there anything neat? Okay. Um, let's go back up. Let's just roll through and see if any of these look cool for, like, like a knight. Like a classic, iconic, like, fantasy knight, because that's the image I want people to have of the Ilian knights in fiction and history. Uh, so Warhammer is not the pick. Um, you know what I'm curious about? I'm curious if they have a unique ability for a katana. No? Okay. That, frankly, that makes sense with, like, the vibe of this whole book, but I was curious. Okay. Um, sickles, short swords. I feel like sickles, and then if they have some kind of, like, scythe ability, uh, those could be good for some kind of book about, like, the improvised weapons of peasantry or something. Uh, right now, what else would be good? Like, a pike or a halberd or something? But those are more soldierly than they are knightly, just in terms of, like, the image. Um, great sword. Okay, yeah. It should probably be great sword. That would make a lot of sense. So it's just all the swords. Um, okay, the Beast of Branton. Uh, long sword, short sword. Uh, we'll put this in a different order. Uh, great sword. Long sword, short sword, and um, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> Short sword unlocks a unique ability for the, um, and this is the protection, right? We decided on protection. Uh, no, we decided on defense, because knights defend other people and saints defend themselves. Um, great sword, long sword, short sword, defense, fighting style, steal as quick as wit. Uh, this, uh, oh, nope, it's called. Okay, uh, Beast of Branton, it's gonna be by, um, some, some Ordidian person. This is a book written locally, it's a piece of fiction about the saints, that makes sense. Um, and it's gonna be written in Ordinian, which is basically common, which is weird in this setting because most books are written in like pseudo-Latin, Ilian. Um, and it's going to take four hours uh, to read because it's a short little piece of fiction. Uh, this is a piece of fiction that ostensibly I wrote as a short story. Let's see if I have it easily accessible right now. Um, Ooh, let's see, is this a 20-page version? Uh, <clears throat> no, because this still has fills in it. Okay. Um, closer to finish? That might be it. Uh, yep, this is the 20-page version. Okay, so this is the piece of fiction that this is ostensibly based on. Um, so... 
I will try to find an interesting passage from here, and I'll pull that out as the eye catch quote. Or, um... Okay. So, Steel's Quick as Writ. We have an idea what it is. Um, Beast of Branton. We've got some idea what it is. Uh, pull from actual fiction. Um, uh, a... A grim historical uh, fictive story about uh, the death of a knight uh, near the end of High Saint Orden, who is Ord in Orden. That's a lot of Ord in a row. That needs revision just because it's a lot of. High Saint Orden, who is Ord in Ordenheim, which, like, in the setting makes sense, but also as a piece of, like, like fiction, that is the same word over and over and over. Okay, um... Uh, great sword, long sword, short sword, defense fighting style, plus five to intelligent checks regarding the contents of this text. Cool. Um, and then we're gonna make one more copy, uh, which is... LB, um... Uh, the Warlike Saint. And it's, this one's going to be like an actual nonfiction text about, uh, uh, nonfiction text about what it was like to actually fight saints. Um, and it's probably going to be written by somebody who's not from Ordenheim. Um, this is going to be written by a Brindalian person, because the Brindalians were the people with the most recent living memory of being conquered by the aliens. Uh, written in, um, Brindalian, maybe? I don't know what language they speak in Brindle. I need to find out what they do. Um, eight hours. Uh, pull from the action. I, I've been making the default kind of 12 and then making it shorter for, like, odd books and, like, particularly short books. Um, Okay. 12 hours, um, 4 hours, because the Beast of Burnton is, like, ostensibly a short story. Um, the Warlike Saints. Um, okay. Um, okay. And this is going to be highlight some specific named saints. Uh, talk about uh, blunt weapons and big shields. Talk about using spicy magic, because that's the saint's thing. Talk about uh, bringing saints back from the dead. Because in the setting, the only people who can bring people back from the dead are saints. And uh, mostly they just brought other saints back to life. They weren't super broadly giving with that unique special power. Um, if you can't tell. Sam Sparkman doesn't think very highly of the Saints. Most of the people in my D&D setting do think very highly of the Saints. That's what you get. Okay. Uh, and this one is going to be for the uh, mace. For the... Uh, and it's going to be the protection. This one is the protection because the protection is the one that's mostly... Uh, Okay, cool. Um, wait, just a second. So, just a second. Okay, when a creature targets a weapon other than you... That does make more sense for the knights, but also this other ability protection to highlight shield use more, which I like for the knights. Um, okay. Um... We'll figure that out momentarily. What are the weapons that we can make relevant here? Okay, so we've got... Battle axes. Okay, clubs. Probably we'll have clubs in there. Uh, club. Great club. Ooh, we might need lance to be one of the knight weapons. But also, in the story of the Beast of Branton, there are no lances. 
So we'll, we'll no, we'll have the lance be part of like a specifically a like mounted combat kind of lore book. Okay. Um, Mace and Maul, Mace Maul and Morningstar are much more saintly. Okay. Mace Maul Morningstar. Um. Yeah. Okay. May small morning star. Great. Locks you need ability for the defense fighting style. Five and plus five intelligence checks to contents of this text. Uh, cool. So we've kind of plotted these out. Let's see if I can add a little bit to Steel as Quick as Wit. An adverb, uh, heavy adventure novel, Steel as Quick as Wit, details the exploits of the fictional, um, fictional noble Attilia Tibers, uh, a lesser family in the Hyalian Empire. The Tibers must fight for their survival and advancement in the face of countless unknown enemies. Attilia herself is the swashbuckling young head of the Tibers household. Who, after being, um, who... After being orphaned at a young age, adapted quickly to the world of court of courtly intrigue. She has at varying times been been spy, lover, and battle commander. But above all, Attilia is renowned as a court duelist. Uh Okay. Um ooh. And then what's a cool name for a small sword? What is a good, okay. So like the problem is the brain immediately goes to needle. Cause like how often do you see a, like is needle a small sword? I don't think needle like technically like looks like a small sword. That's not the tab that I meant to open but now I just want to watch this fight again cause I had a lot of fun with it. Um, is needle a small sword? Okay. Just a second. Let me look at it. No. Okay. So needle is like distinct. Oh, this is a weird sword. Also, like the shape of it is very much not. Okay. This looks more like a small sword because it's got a little, or like a small sword, like a, a rapier because it's got the swoop D, but it's still like distinctly not. Okay. Just a second. This is a, this has become a thing in my brain. Because, like, small swords have this really, really particular guard. Like, this is the really particular guard of a small sword. It's, like, the the very small cup with the little brace and then with a st kind of stirrup hilt looking thing around the edge. Or, apparently, no stirrup hilt if you're rogue steel and actually want people with hands to be able to fit those hands on the sword. Which is the problem I have with stage combat small swords most of the time is that my hand just physically won't go on to the grip, especially because really you don't want to hold a small sword like a hammer. You want to like hold it with kind of a pistol grip with your thumb on the back and like if this is the space you have to do that. I am getting way out of the point. But the other thing about small swords is they kind of have this blade more like this where I've seen most small swords have this kind of like three-sided... Um, like, they have a blade shape that is a lot more rapier, a lot more like this kind of like three ankled thing, and it's less of a typical sword, uh, where you have like a long flat with like a blade on one or two sides, and then this kind of single divot down the middle, the name of which I don't remember, whereas needle distinctly like the blade looks like a normal sword. It doesn't look like a small sword. Mm. Okay. This was an entirely unnecessary tangent. All that to say that Needle is not a small sword and that we still need a good uh, name for it. Um, ladies Kiss uh, or Fortune's Kiss. Uh, small sword, Fortune's Kiss. Um, A, um, family crest. This is boring. The buckler part is boring. Um, family crest. Uh, 
fill with cool stuff um, in the in the titular adventure um, oh god we said it's a novel we didn't say it's a collection of stories we said it's a novel Okay, details their exploits of the fictional Italian noble Tiber's Alessio family. Um, so now we need to know what the actual plot of Steel as Quick as With It. We know that there's an evil count, so we can guess that we can make this a little bit Hamlet, because we've got like evil count that we're in a duel with. Um, we'll probably have poison in here somewhere. Okay, that's what Steel as Quick as Wit is going to be. Um, And okay, cool. And then the Beast of Branton is going to be um, okay. And then the Warlike Saint nonfiction text, Silver and Gold is already written. Silver and Gold is mostly already written. Silver and Gold by Armin Lillianblatt, translated to Ordinian from Ilian by the First Bank of Heldebri. A matter-of-fact text with a biting sense of humor, Silver and Gold blends a history of Ilian currency with a practical guide to its modern use. Acknowledging that fortune tends to favor those already fortunate, it is Lillian Blatt's advice that a reader should seek out the seeds of wealth at their earliest convenience. And as those possessing wealth are rarely inclined to dispose of it, its acquisition will necessarily involve some degree of thievery. Um, the trick, then, the author writes, is to avoid the reputation of a common pickpocket by sealing very large, rather than very small, sums at a time. At this point, one should gain the reputation of a person of great importance. Along with advice on financial matters result re related to saving, haggling, and contracting are included traditions related to Ilian coinage. It is common practice among both the superstitious and the very short on coin to demand a single iron bit be added to any payment made to them. This assures that your partner is not one of the fey who despise the touch of iron, and only a fool who parts with coin so easily one would think they despised its touch. Similarly, large purchases are made at the addition of a silver, single silver coin. Apparently, devils are disinterested in the souls of those who uh, of the impoverished. Um, I, this needs revision in the actual text and language because uh, I think it's kind of clumsy and clunky. But with this one, I'm trying to teach people a little bit about the coinage and the currency, but also. Also, I'm using it to sneak in information about fairies and devils, because fairies and devils show up a lot in my game, and it is very useful information for a player to know that fey hate the touch of iron, and devils hate the touch of silver. And so that's information that's useful outside of the specific context that this book is about. That is, like, specifically relevant information for, like, combat or puzzles or narrative stuff. And then there's also the very specific mechanical effect that you get this discount from having, like, read this book and you're, like, good with money now. Anyways, that's kind of the idea of the lore book stuff. Um... I'm not finding a lot of success in, like, actually writing today. Um, at least on stream. I have a feeling I'd be going a little bit quicker off stream. But um, that is kind of what I had in the docket for today. Um, now here's the real question. Do I switch over and just play some video games on stream? Or do I call it for the day and do i say hey it's been lovely and it's been like two hours and i hope you all have had a good time but uh maybe it's time for us to call it for the day i don't know how much stamina that i have for streaming so far um i think that for now i'm gonna call it i'm gonna bring this to a close i'm gonna stop doing this and i'm going to um try to bring it back either tomorrow or on Saturday because I've been having a lot of fun with this. I just think that I've kind of worked through my set of stuff to do today and my energy to do creative work on camera. So, hey y'all, it's been lovely and I appreciate you. I appreciate you person who's here right now and I'm really, really grateful to everybody else that has cycled in and out over the course of this stream. I really appreciate you all. I'm really grateful for your presence. I'm really grateful for the support that you're showing with this thing that I've decided to start doing on an absolute whim. So 
thank you. I love you all very much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And I hope that you come back and I get to talk to you sometime soon. Bye now.